Welcome to Citizen Assembly Thunderdome, where we test ideas and hone debate skills in real life social political arena with the goal of holistic balance. If you'd like to participate, find out how in our podcast description. Let's start with a round of introductions from our panelists. We've got about 30 seconds apiece to tell our listeners and the group a little bit about ourselves. So I will go first. My name is Megan and I am based out of Texas right now. And I have a wide variety of interests, but uh, most right now it's mostly in education as we'll talk about tonight, but also in nutrition as well. So now I will go ahead and ask Dan, would you please introduce yourself to the group? So I'm Dan Bader uh, from Chicago. Uh, I've retired from the Chicago Department of Public Health and my interests are public health, mental health, uh, abrupt climate change, and currently uh, biowarfare vaccination issues uh, and uh, depopulation agendas. Yeah, I, that's super interesting, Dan. It was interesting. I did a YouTube video on my own channel the other day mentioning uh, viruses and the real nature of viruses, and they took it down within like five minutes. I was like, wow. And I didn't even mention any of like the like corona or anything. It literally was just the real nature of viruses, but um, it went against their agenda. So it's frustrating for sure. But uh, Ramses, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, sure, my name is Ramses. Uh, I'm joining you guys from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, and yeah, I once had a YouTube video removed as well. And I got a warning just because you know somebody complained about the content. Uh, I'm interested in computer science, logic, and human rights. Awesome. Thank you for being here, Ramses. Stacy, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Stacy Gustafson. I split my time between Northern Michigan and Southwest Texas. And my major focus is holistic community problem solving. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Stacey. Lois, would you please introduce yourself to the group? Yes. Hello, my name is Lois Diggs, and I am in Norfolk, Virginia, United States. Um, my main interests are reformation of culture and re-examining our foundational philosophical assumptions on life. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lois, for joining us. And last but not least, Cesare, would you please introduce yourself? I'm Cesare from uh, the outskirts of Chicago. My main interests are, are economics and ethics. And my main concerns as an activist are animal liberation and social and economic justice. Thank you for having me here today. This should be fun. Yes, this should be fun. A really interesting, kind of, in a way, very thought-provoking discussion. So thank you for the introduction, Suzari. And now we're going to go ahead and move on to the presentation of the idea. And today it's my idea, which is all about compulsory schooling and civil war. This idea has been written up in Agora, which is the worldwide stock market of ideas that you can find at agora-ilp.org. Agora is an online platform where people from around the world can turn their ideas into policy to help build a better world. So I'm going to start screen sharing and we will proceed with the reading. Um, Stacy, do you mind giving me sharing abilities, please? This idea, I actually, thank you, Stacy, by the way. I first started thinking about it a couple months ago when I was reading uh, one of the books that I'm gonna mention in here by the Dean of the Stanford School of Education named Elwood Coverley in the 1900s. He was very, very, very prominent in shaping modern schooling. And he kept mentioning a link between the civil war and education. And so it inspired me to do a little deeper dive into it. And we'll see how the discussion goes. Okay, so compulsory schooling and the civil war. So I start with a quote from one of my favorite authors, but we've had a society essential under, or essentially under central control in the United States since just after the Civil War. And such a society requires compulsory schooling, government monopoly schooling to maintain itself from John Taylor Gatto, who actually wrote this book called Dumbing Us Down, the hidden Com curriculum of compulsory schooling. Gatto was a school teacher for 30 years in New York until he realized that he was actually being paid to dumb down his students. So he quit teaching and he dedicated the remainder of his life to uncovering the true history of the school system. So a thank you to him for a lot of the research as well as come from um, what he's uncovered. 
Moving into the idea. Instances of widespread political disorder, such as citizen revolts and civil wars, threaten political elites' power and are a key factor that prompt elites to turn to compulsory schooling as a means to contain future political instability by using these institutions as a tool to instill values of order, submission, obedience, and fixed habits of reaction to authority that will prevent such future rebellions from occurring against the state. In the short term, schools help contain students and prevent their participation in rebellions in the streets. And in the long term, schools serve as a tool to prevent future adults from developing a desire to rebel against authority. The concept of political elites responding to civil wars and other forms of resistance with state controlled public school systems that prevent such resistance to authority from repeating itself by cultivating a population of weak docile sheep has been put into practice for centuries. So let's take a look at Prussia, for example. Before the outbreak of the Seven Years' War, King Frederick II had plans to institutionalize a state-run compulsory school system. However, the outbreak of war forced him to postpone his plans until after. The economy and way of life was changing rapidly in Prussia in the 1740s and 50s. In response to inflation leading to higher cost of goods, wealthy landowners increased the number of days that their peasants were required to work. Filled with rage at their exploitation, the peasants revolted against their masters. It was a bitter battle, and it ended with King Frederick II passing an ordinance that reduced the number of days that peasants were required to work to try to appease the situation. With the authority of the landowners over the peasants having diminished significantly, the need for a new authority to replace the former arose. This need to control was executed through the establishment of a state-run compulsory school system about which King Frederick II believed, we do not confer upon the individual or upon society any benefit when we educate him beyond the bound of his social class and vocation. Attendance in state-run compulsory schools after the war skyrocketed and soon Prussia would become the model of efficiency and implementation for other countries to follow, including our very own United States of America. Now let's look at Argentina. So after the prolonged series of civil wars that lasted between 1814 and 1880, the Federation of Buenos Aires was established and Julio Roca was elected as president. Roca led the formation of a centralized state bureaucracy and appointed Domingo F. Sarmiento as the superintendent general of schools. Domingo was tasked with drafting a bill that mandated primary education for all children ages 6 to 14 and for all teachers to be trained in state mandated normal schools to receive certain certifications that proved that they could teach. This bill became known as Law 1420. Following the, law, uh, the war, accelerated attendance in schools immediately followed. We'll also look at Chile. So in January of 1859, military leaders in Actama rebelled against the central government in Santiago. They questioned authoritarianism, opposed church and state intermission, and demanded lower export taxes on copper and silver. After four gruesome months, the Chilean government defeated the revolting citizens. And in 1860, or 60, following the end of the war, Congress passed the first national law regarding the government's involvement in education. This was known as the General Law of Primary Education, and it established the central government as the primary controller of schools in Chile. By 1863, there was a rapid increase in the number of schools and the students that were enrolled in them. The timing of the 1860 law is suggestive that the 1859 Civil War prompted congressional members to work together in unison toward the formation of a national compulsory schooling system that would help prevent future rebellions against authority. Interestingly, the central government's efforts to expand compulsory schooling were far greater in provinces where the rebels had been most difficult to defeat and posed the greatest challenge to the state. So now let's look at the United States of America. Could it be possible that the American Civil War was much more than a battle of differences between the North and the South, and that it too served the greater purpose of establishing more government control through the implementation of state mandated compulsory schools? Well, in his 1916 publication of Public School Administration, 
Elwood P. Coverly, the Dean of the Stanford School of Education wrote that the battle for the establishment of tax supported public schools was a bitter one. But after about 1850, it had been won in every Northern state. In the Southern states, with two or three exceptions, little was accomplished until after the Civil War and the period of Reconstruction were over. So just how bitter was this battle against state mandated public schools? According to John Taylor Gatto in his 1992 book, Dumbing Us Down, The Hidden Curriculum of Compulsory Schooling, forced government schooling was resisted sometimes with guns by an estimated 80% of the Massachusetts population, the last outpost and barn stable on Cape Cod, not surrendering its children until the 1880s, when the area was seized by militia and the children marched to school under guard. In his 1976 book, The Goddess, The School Book and Compulsion, Charles Burgess suggested that following the Civil War, a dramatically different concept of union gained popularity, primarily along, among uh, intellectuals. The imperatives of the union required the Americanization of all citizens. And thus a trend towards national compulsion began, the enactment of compulsory voting laws, national rules and regulations on marriage and divorce, and the rise of attendance in state mandated compulsory schools. And so I end with this. In discussing forced government schooling further, Coverley notes that this movement was well underway by 1850, but it was checked for nearly three decades by the discussion preceding the Civil War, the war itself, and the period of reconstruction following the war. After about 1875 or 1880, the movement toward a greater unification and control of the different school systems went forward rapidly. And since 1900, the progress of this movement has been very marked. The process has been one of the transference of powers from small communities to larger schools in the interest of greater efficiency in school administration. The school district has been forced to surrender powers to the township, the township in turn to the county, and the county in turn to the state, meaning state as a nation overall. And then below here are some of the books and sources I referred to if you would like to do your own research into these and I will put that link to this idea in the chat. Okay, so and just as once again, the idea was summarized at the very top. I know it was a lot of information. The point was for the idea and then the supporting evidence. So if anybody would like to reread the idea again, I'm going to copy and paste that right now in right. the chat. Okay, and we can take, and hello, welcome. So we can go ahead and take a, just a vote, a general vote. Who is in agreement with this idea? Just show of hands. Okay, so it looks like Dan is kind of halfway there. Cesare is abstaining. And then um, I, I wanna make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. So um, Al Hassan, is that right? It's actually Abdul. Oh, Abdul. Okay, great. Welcome, Abdul. Well, I put the link in the chat to the idea we're discussing, Abdul. So feel free if you need to take a couple moments to go ahead and. Um, you. All right. Okay. Uh, that's okay. I've seen it. I'll go ahead and I'll check it out. Okay, awesome. Well, we'll take another vote at the end, too. Whoops, Megan, you got muted. Oh, okay, thank you for letting me know. So if anybody would like to support the idea in Agora, you may do so. I just put the link in the chat and then we'll take uh, another rain check of that at the end to see if anybody does. So let's go ahead and move into discussion. If anybody wants to start us out with any comments or specific questions. Okay, Cesari and then Ramses. And then we can just type hand up in the chat too, that way we can keep better order. But go ahead, Cesari. I think Ramses, you wanna go first? You can go first, Cesari. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, looking at the, the content of this idea that schooling these institutions are a tool to instill values of order, submission, obedience, and fix, fixed habits of reaction to authority uh, that will prevent, continuing, that will prevent future rebellions from occurring against the state. I don't necessarily see this as a bad thing. Um, I think uh, 
values of order, submission, obedience, big fixed habits. Those are pretty good things, actually. It you know I think just like with any tool, it matters how it's used. Um, and I think so. I think you're very much focusing on the negatives of how this tool is being used, but there are also positive positive aspects of how this is being used. Uh, I mean, I, it, it does create a more stable society and we want that, that is a good thing. That does increase efficiency. And I also think you neglect to focus on, uh, because, because sure, there are arguments against public schooling, but the question is, you know, what are the arguments for public schooling? And which arguments are better? And overall, when you sum all of this up somehow, you know, put all of this, calculate it all together, where does the preponderance of evidence lie? In favor of public schooling or against it? Um, I, and so, yeah, in a sense, it's like an evil, but it's kind of like an, a necessary, like centralization is an evil, but sometimes it's a necessary evil. And because it, there's this also like this added benefit that if you do have a lot of wealth disparity in a society that you can tax, um, well, of course it depends on how you administer your taxes, but you can tax the wealthy, even with a flat tax, you can tax the wealthy more to make sure that everyone is educated to an equal standard. Because even the wealthy, even the oligarchs, they want their kids to go to school too. Like they actually want their kids to be educated and all the things that teach, teach us in school. I, I think you ne neglect to acknowledge that, that schooling is also good for, you know, for, for the oppressors. Uh, they still, want, so why, why is that? Um, because I think you actually also learn a lot of useful things in school. And so I, I think you, you, you do have to acknowledge that. Now, whether the best way, if, is there a better way to do education, you know, and, and socializing people and instilling those values of submitting to order? Um, you know, is there a better way? Uh, and I think this is really a balancing act. So I think we have to look at the positives and the negatives, but you just look at the negatives. But I, I do agree with some of the stuff that you're saying. So I, I yield. I cannot wait to respond to that, Cesare, but I'm gonna go ahead and go over to Ramses first. I can't wait to respond to this as well. And actually, um, like every single word has a response. But anyways, I, I wanted to say that Honestly speaking, I don't see the link between uh, the civil war so, but, uh... Uh, between civil war and um, ed education in general or the idea itself. Um, and actually, um, I'm not American, you know, so you know much better than me. But my understanding is that even if the civil war hadn't happened, we still would have schooling and education just like today. Uh, and finally, I, I didn't read the book, by the way, so I still, I, I cannot judge my thoughts. I might be wrong. But in general, I would say that the idea of authority seems to relate to schooling very much. And I think everybody agrees with me on that. And authority itself is something that is very rejected and it doesn't lead to stability at all. And uh, that's it for me. Great, great points, Ramses. Thank you for bringing that up. To address some things that Cesari said, you said that schooling helps create a stable society. In what way is our modern society stable? As I said, school pretty much just teaches you how to be a sheep and submit to the rule of the government and not think for yourself whatsoever. I reason that if we didn't have schooling, a lot of issues in society having to do with crime, um, people acting out wouldn't exist because schooling is just a huge part in the network society. And part of what it means to be human is to be involved in a community and to be an individual. And there is no individuality in schools at all. Schools are actually designed to drain the individuality out as it's said by, as you said, the people that composed it. And yes, for the people behind the school system, Frederick Taylor Gates, Elwood P. Coverley, John D. Rockefeller, William T. Harris, 
there's a list could go on. Yes, it benefits them financially and in many other ways too, because now they, as Rockefeller said, he doesn't want a nation of thinkers. He wants a nation of workers. So sure, he's benefited. Um, so yeah, I see it. And actually school is doing a phenomenal job at what it's designed to do. Phenomenal. It works great for indoctrination, but not for education. And if we actually measure about our population, I mean, think about why is Igor even a thing? Why do we even need to control the government? Because things are so out of hand, largely due to just the network society, because uh, it takes away meaning from people. These schools are horrible because children are taken away from their parents and raised in government institutions, which are what schools are for 13 years of their life, if you include kindergarten. So when they should be outside playing or following mom and dad around apprenticing, they're locked in classrooms, shielded away from the sun, shielded away from nature. And all the things that were taught in school have nothing to do with reality. It's just somebody's beliefs that they wrote in a textbook and passed it on to the teacher. Not even the teacher's beliefs. The teacher's just further regurgitating information. And there's many subliminal messages in school that destroy individuality. And another thing I would say, Cesare, is in conversations we've had, you've mentioned how um, difficult it is to find people who can think for themselves, right? You've said that before. Yeah, well, that's due to the school system because it's designed to make people not think for themselves. So is it a necessary evil? No, it's not. Uh, there are benefits of schooling, but most of them are for this very, very small group of people in power. And Cesar, you created an organization to drain that power. So to support schooling and to do that just to me doesn't, uh, I don't see how that connects. I will yield for now. So Abdul, please go next. Um, before I will, I, will, I will begin with my presentation now, let's, let's take a look at uh, in the zoo, you know, uh, they take a lion from the zoo and then uh, they, they put it in a cage and then they try to, 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 I mean, to facilitate and control what the lion is, when it is and whatever it does. And I don't know who, who tells whoever has put the lion in the cage that it wants to be in the cage, it wants to, be, to eat what it is being given, and it wants to, you know, to sleep at the time that it is, it is ordered or it is expected to sleep. I see school to be like, uh, 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 school is, is like some kind of cage. It's a cage, you know, like when you look at the, you know, the initial starting of school, it, it is meant like to educate people. People should be allowed to learn what they want to learn and when they want to learn. That's why like, I believe so much in homeschooling. You don't get to send your children to school and then somebody else would, would, would start you know, to even shove things down there, the, the truth of the children when they don't have interest in those things. School should, like, it should be open for people to come in and learn whatever they think they want to learn for themselves. I, I sometimes, like, I am, I am a university student. Sometimes they put certain things in, in, in my courses and I feel like, me, what I want to do, I don't need this course. But now this is, they have added it to my course. I need to, 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 to learn it and I'll be forced to do it. And I've seen people unable to, to, to go to the tertiary institutions just because they are unable to pass one or two subjects. It shouldn't be that people should be al allowed to learn according to their capabilities and, 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 and their strengths and weaknesses. But here you just come and they control your thinking and all that. What, is, what causes rebellion? Let's look at what causes rebellion. We say that the power is with the people. The government is for the people by the people. So why why would why would why would you try to you know now why would you try to find ways to suppress the voice of the people to suppress them from you know from calling out for help and from uh, uh, showing their displeasure in whatever you are doing as 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 the government? Why would you why, what 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 cause for it? People don't just come out and start. Uh, uh, engaging pro in protests and you know and uh, uh, some sort of violent activities just because they want to do that. Probably people can't start in the because their demands are not being met. 
when their demands are not being made, that's what's going to happen. It's going to happen. Like in Africa, here, most or almost all our, our educational policies, our, it is not, it is, everything is not formulated by us. It, that is how it looks like it has been formulated by us, but it is, it, in real, from the initial state, it is not being formulated by us. It is all being affected by foreign policy. Some people sit outside there and, and then they will dictate to, to us Africans what we should study in our schools. And our, some of our leaders, they are so blind. They can't, like, they can't think beyond their nostrils. So they just go in and they take those uh, policies and they bring it and we are suffering. I, I still can't understand why for, for after 64 years of independence, my country, Ghana, is still unable to process uh, crude oil from, from, from its initial state, from its raw state to, to its complicity without necessarily taking out to, to a different country where they will have to do and, and, and take more than 80% of, 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 of the oil and then only the, the remaining is here in, in Africa. And uh, most of it would even go into what? Uh, 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 into pockets of selfish leaders. Why, why, why would, why, why, why for that long term, for, for 60 years, more than 60 years, and since after now with this education system that they are using, and still people are not realizing their dreams. A lot of dreams are being put to death in this country just because of this educational system. It is a cage. Anything that you want to do outside of it, it's, it's like you are made to look like a rebel. You are made to look like an, art, an outcast. But it, it shouldn't be that way. People should be allowed to learn what they want to learn and when they want to learn. I don't see why I would take my child to school who wants to, to, to only learn about aviation. And then I take the child to school and you are teaching the child about uh, uh, something else. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. People, children should be allowed to, to learn uh, according to what, what they really want to learn. You know, when we were kids here, there was this uh, 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 activity that they used to do uh, when we were about to vacate. Uh, we, they used to call it art and craft. That day, each school-going child would come back home and use and, and, and make anything with their hands, anything they could make. Anything, they could make anything out of anything and bring it to the school to present it to the teachers just to see what this child is interested in and what the child uh, uh, might be able to do. And some of us, we used to get uh, tin cans, and, and, and tin cans, and then we make cars out of it. We make uh, uh, a lot of cars, different types of cars, and we try to make anything out of it, and we go and present it as art and craft. And uh, Abdul, keep it down. Abdul, I'm so sorry to cut you off because you're preaching right now. You really are. I love everything you're saying. Can we come back to you because um, so that way we can get around. I think we'll, we should start timing us all at like between three and five minutes, and then if we get over, we'll just come back. But keep right. exactly where you want. Three minutes is plenty. Okay, three minutes. Okay, that's what we'll do. So we'll keep, and I'll actually, I'll just keep a regular time and then pay attention. This goes for everybody, even myself, because I tend to over talk to um, pay attention to the screen and then we'll let you know whenever there's time. But Cesar, you are next. Megan, could you please allow Abdul to wrap up this point? Sure, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Abdul, if you can wrap up as quick summary of what you were saying. Yeah, so, so, so what I'm saying is uh, the school, yeah, there's, there's the need for school. There's the need for education, but people should be allowed to learn what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. As far as it doesn't put others in danger. Let, let's not sit down for somebody else to come and tell us what we should learn. It should be open so that people can get to decide what they want to learn and not uh, uh, what somebody else will sit down and say they want to learn. It's like some kind of prison where you are all in the inmates and then they decide to tell you whatever you want to do, when to do and how to do it. And it shouldn't be that. It's like, you can't think for yourself. You don't know what you need and what you want. So I really, I'm really hoping that like the, 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 the method of schooling and the way of schooling in the world will change. And I'm hoping that we will have a great deal of impact in that. I yield the floor. Thank you, Abdul. Very, very well said. I agree. School is like a, a cage that traps people, but they don't even realize the cage is there. And so it's like, how can they ever get out? So really, really great points. Thank you so much for that. Cesare, go ahead. So kind of to comment on what Abdul was saying, because uh, I've recently 
redevelop this one, like the leading education idea in Igora, and it's also getting quite a bit of support. Uh, but one of the points is to say that people should be exposed, especially bringing up children to be citizens, they should be exposed to certain materials, to certain ideas. They should be aware that those things exist. And, and really as a part of their rite of passage to becoming citizens, like maybe they're not interested in biology, but there are certain things about biology that they should know. There are certain things about math that they should know. Um, there are certain things about, or, or at least that math exists you know, or that biology exists, that people actually study this and they know what they're talking about when they spend a lot of their time using the scientific method to study things. You don't have to be an expert on it, but I think you should be aware that this exists. So having this kind of standardized base of knowledge, I think it's very important for people in the society. Uh, but there are many different ways of delivering this kind of education. And this is one of the, the points I think that you, the differences that you tend to make, Megan, is that you draw the difference between education and schooling. Uh, and because you are in favor of education, but it's schooling that you have a problem with. I, I think it's a matter of how schooling is done because uh, schooling is just a way to, to attempt to do education. And not to say that that's the complete way of doing education. There's more to education that some, some of it just has to be done a, uh, on your own. But, um, but the point is, is that since the last time that we've had this discussion, I'm curious, uh, well, because I brought up, I said that, you know, Finland has an education system that's ranked number one in the world, and that people are extremely happy with it. And so since the time I mentioned it, and I'd really like to give uh, to give a yes or no answer to this, have you looked into the Finland's education system? Because I am expecting, and I, I hope I'm wrong, but I am, I'm willing to bet that you've spent your time just learning about how much you hate school rather than actually educating yourself about other people who do it right. So please prove me wrong and, and tell me that you've actually researched the, the Finnish education system. Did you do it or not? Are, are you finished with your point? I am finished with my point. Okay. Okay, thank you, Cesar. So I'm next. Uh, to answer your most recent question, I'm not in favor of any kind of schooling that has to do with the centralized government. So no, I have not looked at Finland because I don't believe in schooling in general. In fact, I advocate that we just tear down the entire school system and we don't rebuild any kind of centralized system. But in fact, schooling begins or education is something that's done privately within the family. It's an intimate experience that no centralized body should ever do. So the Finland school system, uh, the idea of a state centralized school system is not in any field of my interest. I'm all about decentralizing and restoring family and thus community. Now to comment on um, one brief thing that Cesare mentioned, and then I wanna kind of bring it back into the connection uh, about civil war, which is the basis of this discussion. I agree, Cesare, what you said, that children should be exposed to a wide variety of experiences and topics and the modern school system is not the way to do that because it kills curiosity for most people. I know it did for me and so I actually wasn't in schooling anymore and then I realized that I could learn the things that I wanted to and it, it that's real education. Uh, schooling is, as I wrote in the chat, it's just indoctrination. It's the imposing of one's beliefs upon another and in this, the modern school system the kids actually don't have a choice they're graded based on their performance, uh, not for who they are as a person or what they're oh, capable of doing in the world, but of how some far off stranger says that they can uh, respond to information or regurgitate information. Education is more of an intimate experience. It's really about discovering yourself, your purpose, who you are, why you're here. And I believe that nobody should get a schooling until they're educated. Because once you're educated, then you can start to see what kinds of things am I interested in? So I'm interested in homemaking, for example. So I'm learning what are some things that I can do about that? Because I'm now an educated person, I know what I want. And now I can go listen to somebody else who knows more than me. And I can willingly accept them imposing their beliefs because I'm willing. And that's a big difference. And one way we can do that is um, as parents, what we should do to our children is when we homeschool them, 
expose them to a wide variety of activities, expose them to different subjects, different books, different experiences, take them around the city, take them to different farms and families. So they get to see everything in real life. And then as they start to have specialized interests, whether that's biology, horseback riding, baking, or selling eggs at the farmer's market and raising chickens, whatever that is, we start to find whatever they're interested in, whatever their unique factor is and build on that as parents. And I think that's the way it should be done. And then just talking about the civil war, because Ramses, you mentioned that you don't see the exact connection and that's understandable. It's actually a, a very subliminal one. Not that it was the primary cause of the civil war, but I believe that uh, it was definitely an underlying one. If we think about it, the civil war ended physical slavery, but slavery didn't actually go away. It just became spiritual slavery. So now we have a nation and actually a world of people who are enslaved, but they don't even realize they're enslaved because they're not bound in physical chains. And this is actually more detrimental because how can you free yourself if you don't even realize that you're trapped? Okay, I will yield to the who's next. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's Dan and then it's Lois. Yeah, so my my thoughts uh, so far, it, you know, it, it, it seems to me that um, there is the authoritarian nature of schools in general, grammar school and in high school also to a degree. Then when you get to higher education, college, et cetera, uh, you're given much more of a choice in terms of pursuing your interests. What do you major in or what do you minor in or take this course? You, you have uh, a chance to choose where in grammar school and high school, it's less, much less in grammar school. And of course, you do have to learn some basics. You have to learn how to read. You have to learn how to write. You have to learn to be able to do arithmetic, um, you need to know something about, uh, you know, government, history, certain things that they give you in grammar school. Now, the, uh, but of course, it's very authoritarian. And there isn't any issue of choosing what you're interested in or very little. And I, I know from my, my own experience, you know, going to grammar school, and I went to a number of different ones. And even though um, uh, they, there were differences in terms of where I was geographically located, etc., they all were pretty much the same. You went to school, there were all sorts of rules that regulated everything. Um, you were expected basically to get with the program or you were not going to fit in. And, um, you know, so I, I think that uh, unfortunately the curriculum and the choices that are available are very, very limited. And, and the authority, you know, and again, uh, things are a little less authoritarian in high school, much less authoritarian in college, but I'll give you, you know, and, and I was always somebody, uh, who uh, we, I, I didn't respond well to authoritarian structures. And as I mentioned, I think in a previous discussion we had on education, one, one of the most liberating experiences I ever had was when I simply quit high school at age 16, you know, and, and that was not something that was commonly done and it was really looked down upon. Um, but I went ahead and did it. And it was because I found the environment to be so oppressive in so many ways. And um, I did it and I, I stayed out for a year and then went back to uh, a high school where I finished up, which was uh, not very authoritarian at all. It was called Central YMCA, YMCA High School here in Chicago. And, uh, and then at, at a later point in my life, I did teach school for a while. I taught, uh, I had a eighth grade class and uh, high school uh, social stud, freshman social studies. 
And uh, I did my best to introduce material that was interesting. You know, I, I, in, in other words, even though I, I had an eighth grade class or freshman, uh, I would go ahead and I would take some of the anthropological literature, which I thought was very, very interesting and informative, and I would, you know, teach it. And, and uh, you know, it, they liked it, uh, that kind of thing. And, and what, one final uh, thing that I would, that I, I experienced was when I, when I was in college, I took a course in uh, logic in a philosophy department. And uh, the book that was used was written by one of the professors in the department. And I found the, uh, you know, kind of what the, you know, the language that they were using to express logical propositions, et cetera. Uh, uh, I found it to be uh, very much uh, kind of confusing and I didn't care for it. So I went and got another book on philosophical logic, logic in a philosophy department, not math. And, and, and I went ahead and I talked with the professor and I said, you know, this book is really good. You know, this is how, in a way, naive I was at, at that point in time. And I said, would you mind if I actually use this other language to, you know, in, instead of what's in the text? And of course, I was told, um, no, you know, you, you can't do that. And I, I was just, you know, I was, I was kind of in a, uh, it, it seemed to me to be very unfair, you know, in, in my mind at that point. And, and so I went ahead and when we had our final exam, which was pretty much the whole thing, I went ahead and used this other uh, symbolism uh, to answer the questions. And then at the end of the course, he, you know, the guy, I still, you know, uh, this Professor Chihara, he went ahead and gave me an F. He just failed me in the course. And, uh, you, you know, it was just pretty, the message was, uh, it's not about what you learn, but you were being, you know, disrespectful to the guy who wrote the book and, you know, et cetera, and you're getting an F. And so I retook the course, you know, the next quarter, and then I ended up getting an A minus in it. Uh, and, but it, it taught me, uh, a, a lesson, which is, uh, it's it's about you have to do what you're expected to do, and even if there's uh, another way which is easier, it's it's not allowed. And and that that's on a college level. If you take it down to when kids are in grammar school, and uh, there's so many problems, and even in high that come about. Somebody may not have uh, necessarily mastered the arithmetic they teach you in second grade. And then, but you know, you kind of were there, you get promoted, okay, sorry, I'm gonna wind it up. Thank you, Cesare. Uh, so, you know, what happens is individuals get lost in the system. They just simply, uh, you know, suffer for it. And so I would say curriculum is really important, much more choice and the obedience to authority that you get instilled with uh, uh, is, is a real problem. And so many people end up hating school, just simply hating it because of that authoritarian rigidity. And uh, thank you for, for the time. Yeah, a great point, Dan. It really results in a hatred of school and really just a hatred in learning in general. Not even the hatred, but more of just complete uninterest, curiosity destroyed. Thank you, Dan, for that. Stacy, you are next. Okay, public schooling for the purpose of keeping people from learning. Um, Cesare, you said that you believe in the public schooling, but um, it's based on control and teaching us, making sure that we, the, the, there's a quote, Megan, that you have that says, it was created in order to make sure that we don't 
become philosophers and architects and everything they're trying to and it, it was repeated over and over this, it is there to keep us at a level of vocation so that we will fulfill their workforce and so to say that and, and then to say that schools public schools are needed in order to teach these basic things uh, I heard from another talk that literacy was better before public schools and the connection to the civil war wars I think has been made clear by Megan that when countries have a civil war, they want to do something so it doesn't happen again. And it appears well laid out that the answer is public schooling to make people not think for themselves, which is the result of public school. And you said elites send their children to public schools. I beg to differ. And um, the schools, this is a, from a book that I read called Sand Talk by an Aboriginal um, man in Australia. And he said, there's actual brain damage that is caused by our schools because of the boredom that is created so early. It, it, it changes the way our brains are formed in a bad way. And um, again, the idea that no one can learn outside of public school, um, I disagree. Thank you. Yeah, super, super great point, Stacey, especially about the fact that the literacy rate was higher before public schooling is true. Uh, Gatto talks about it in his book, too. And we're going to go on to the next person. But one food for thought, the people that built this nation received little to no schooling at all, yet they were quite educated, especially Ben Franklin. His autobiography is a great example of what real, real education looks like. So now we have Ramses, who is next. After Ramses will be Lois and then Cesari. So go ahead, Ramses. Uh, sure. So I think we need to uh, differentiate between primary education and all other forms of education, okay? <clears throat> because we have been talking about things that are essential for people to know, right? Uh, and I think this simply uh, includes the alpha, beta, and the numbers one, two, three, four, right? And nothing more, nothing less, in my opinion. And even the alphabet, you don't, you don't have to learn it. Like back in Egypt, uh, they had like three writing systems and they were not alphabetical at all. And you would learn what you want to learn or not. And you can learn anything at any time. Like if at some point of time you think that you need to learn hieroglyphs, you can simply go to your school or go to a, a, a a, a teacher who teaches you what you want, and that's it. Okay, and nowadays, um, I think maybe computer literacy is, is the most important one. You don't even need to learn to handwrite. We do all most of our writing today using computers. And I think you can learn computers at any stage. Like my parents, for example, didn't have computers when they were babies, okay? And they managed to learn, and, they, I, and I guess this, this applies to all of us. You can learn what you want whenever you want. But, and again, the, for primary education, like even if you claim that the alpha beta is really that important, then please learn it at home. You don't have to go to some authority to first a specific way of learning the alphabets on you. And that's it for me. Thank you, Ramses, great points. Lois, you are up next. Thank you. Um, yes, very good discussion. So just for some background, I was homeschooled uh, from the beginning uh, to uh, graduation from high school. Then I uh, went to a religious university for my bachelor's degree and a public state university for my master's degree. I remember when I first attended classes at university, I felt uh, really motivated to learn in a community, um, much more motivated to learn than I had been when I was being homeschooled. And that might be because I had a foundation of education that could lead me to appreciate the community of learning. I realized that maybe it is possible if I had started out with a uh, public schooling that might have killed my motivation for learning maybe for the rest of my life. Uh, 
but you know, I don't really know like what, what might have been. So um, Abdul earlier said that people should learn what they want to learn. Students should learn what they are interested in. And Cesare counter, countered that with the idea that students should be exposed to certain things and should learn certain things. Uh, I agree with both. I think that it should be the challenge of educators, whether parents, teachers, professors, or parents, parents or teachers, uh, to intentionally nurture curiosity and interest in a topic before teaching it. It is possible. I, I think I remember hearing about uh, parents who uh, wanted their child to go to kindergarten but the child didn't want to go to kindergarten and so they were very very creative with finding a way to make the child want uh this education and i think the same thing can go for learning how to read i do think that learning how to read is essential in our society and culture i do think it is one of those necessary things to learn um, but some students, some children may not want to learn how to read. And in that case, I think the solution is not to just, oh, okay, then we won't teach you. I think the solution is to find how to motivate them and how to interest them and then teach them. Um, uh, I yield the floor. Great point, Lois. Thank you. So Cesare is next, and after that, we're going to move into closing remarks. So I, I want to thank you, Megan, for disproving yourself. I mean, that was actually beautiful to watch. Um, because, you know, I, I, now, of course, I'm, I'm not an authority here, but I, I did tell you that there are people who are actually doing good things uh, with schooling. But yet you insisted on remain you on remaining ignorant about that. You refused to learn. You refused to educate yourself on your own about something that is so interesting to you in general. Like if you consider public schooling to be your enemy, you refuse to learn about your enemy so you can potentially combat it more effectively. So your own education method failed. This is where, this is the proof that people do need outside influence. To, and maybe I was not sufficient enough. Maybe I was not persuasive enough, but I don't really care to like persuade you that much of it because I don't know. It's like, I'm not invested in, in your education all that much. You know, some things you do have. Anyways, the point is, is that the information is out there and you have to seek it out, but not everybody's going to do it. And some things that are essential to our society, we have to ensure that they are, uh, people are exposed to this information. Um, it's not essential for everyone to learn about all the different public schooling models, um, but it's essential to know that there are authorities on, the, on various subjects and that we should go to those authorities and learn from them, not just to believe that we know everything and that just be willfully ignorant about something. Uh, just be dogmatic about our beliefs. So I think that's, uh, you know, pub public schooling is important for, you know, breaking people out of that, showing them that there is, they don't know everything, that they, everything that they think is not right, you know? So anyways, uh, the other point I wanted to make real quick is that, you know, don't fall into this dichotomy. I think everybody here, well, no, not everybody, Abdul and, and Ramses, you're not from the United States, but uh, there's more than just two models of education, homeschooling and American public school system. No, guess what? There are other models of education. So uh, yeah, just wanted to recognize that. So don't base your whole public idea of public schooling based on the American model because it is not good. It's not great. Again, check out the Finnish model. They actually really carry out these values that you talk about, They, you know, about uh, letting the children learn about what they want to learn like helping them learn about what's interesting to them they do it i don't care that much about it i'm not going to investigate it all that much but there are ways the, the point is is from what i heard there are ways of doing it and 
and yeah, it, the other thing is just with funding. Uh, I think in Finland, I think teachers, they make like $70,000 a year or something. Like they are considered as professionals. They don't cut corners on paying, you know, people who are supposed to educate the next generation of society. They're not trying to pay them as, as low as they pay McDonald's employees. You know, they're not making hamburgers. They're supposed to, you know, create the next wave of civilization. You don't kind of cut corners on, on underpaying people like that, you know? Uh, you can't afford to be cheap on those kinds of things. So in Finland, they understand that they pay their teachers well. I think we need to learn from that. These people are professionals. They need to be well paid, um, uh, not overworked. They need to have the time to invest into each student to, you know, to, to help them learn in the ways that, that are best for them. So again, check it out. I yield. All right, thank you, Cesare. So we're out of time now, so we're going to move into closing remarks. But um, I'm going to say one thing, and we'll start with your closing remarks, Abdul, because I see your hand is raised. One quick thing, um, yeah, actually, I, I will. I'll, I'll agree with Cesare in that it is ignorant of me to not look into the Finland system. Although I honestly, I have no desire to look into it. It doesn't interest me because uh, I believe in no schooling is necessary at all. So I don't see how it would be uh, beneficial, but perhaps in the future, I will look at it. And if I do look at it, Cesare, I'll get back to you with my thoughts on that. Uh, you know, schooling takes you away from yourself and our intuitive level, we know a lot more. I think if you were born in nature, you would know everything you needed to succeed. The issue is that schooling confuses that. Not that we all know everything and we shouldn't be curious, but uh, we should trust ourselves way more than authorities. And that's what school teaches. Now, moving into closing remarks, Abdul, please start us off, if you will. Um, you know, uh, this discussion, uh, it, is, it is really so uh, interesting and, and, and brilliant, and it actually opened my eyes. You know, I often thought that this uh, other uh, form of education that Cesare mentioned, uh, Finnish education policy or system or something, I thought is the same thing as like, uh, uh, homeschooling or my idea of homeschooling like you keep the kids at home and you allow them to learn according to uh, you know their interest all you need to do is maybe you need to get private teachers so that they can facilitate whatever the children want to learn i think that is what it is about and with the mention of paying teachers you know uh, the, the, the 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 future of every nation depends on knowledge and the teachers, they are, they are those who propagate the knowledge. So I think they should pay more and then uh, so that, uh, you know, they can do their jobs properly. And to end on this, I think uh, it's really great that we, you know, we, we discuss this idea. And I hope that next time when we have to discuss it, we have more people to participate in this. And then, uh, Subsequently, we would also be able to, you know, to bring this out to the general place of the world and then to make a change so that we will be heard and then uh, our ideas can be implemented. I yield the floor. Awesome. Thank you so much, Abdul, for joining us tonight and for all of your great insights. I will move over to Stacy now. Would you please share your closing remarks? Wow, that uh, we could have gone for three hours or more on this one. Boy, that was a great discussion. I love everybody's comments. And um, yeah, I really believe in this. It's, it's really opened my eyes, the connection to wars. Um, thank you so much for bringing that information up, Megan. I, I had no idea and I think it's really important. And I agree, we should get this information out to everybody. Everybody should know this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stacy. Dan, would you like to share your closing remarks? Yes, uh, well, you know, naturally, I really appreciated uh, the discussion. Uh, very interesting input from people. And, uh, um, you know, a shout out to you, Megan, because you work pretty hard at uh, bringing these topics up. And uh, thank you for doing that. I am more than happy to. I love discussions, especially around this subject. All right, uh, Cesare, would you like to share any closing remarks? Definitely. Uh, so I guess the one point I, I meant to say about the whole f paying uh, teachers better, 
uh, because you know the financial elites they still send their kids to school they just send them to schools where teachers are paid well and uh, you know for a quality education and so the Finnish model I, it, it, it is trying to standardize things but it's not like trying to lower everyone to the lowest level it's actually trying to raise everyone up to that level where the elites would be you know the financial elites uh, so uh, and I, I just want to say the idea that uh, for education I support it's 1115 it's a universal idea uh, I just shared that in the chat if you all want to check it out and I'll be very interested in in presenting that idea in the Thunderdome maybe next time but I yield yeah, I would love that actually, Cesare. If you want to present that next week, please do. Okay, perfect. Uh, Lois, would you like to share any closing remarks? Yes, I would. Thank you, Megan. So um, just a general comment. I am very amazed, blown away by the information presented in the idea you've written, especially about the armed uh, rebellion to compulsory public education in Massachusetts, 80%. That's That number is very hard to believe. And I am shocked. And uh, if this is true, I do agree with Stacy and that this these sort of things should be um, public knowledge, um, at least more than it is now. Uh, also, um, I, I think that Ramses made a very good point about uh, distinguishing uh, b between different types of education at different stages. Right now, I'm thinking it probably is a good idea to begin with a foundation of education in uh, the personal type in the home. Um, but because uh, it is important, I think, to be exposed to different ideas that maybe one's parents don't know or, or don't talk about that they should go to schooling at least for a time afterwards, probably when they're a little bit older and more established and um, have that foundational desire to learn and are a little more uh, secure in, the, in themselves. Um, and finally, I would say that I also would like to look into Finnish education to see what they do right and compare it also with their history. What's the history of their public education? Did it come as a result of a ward or did the people request it? I really don't know the answer, but I look forward to finding out. Thank you each and every one of you for your comments. I enjoyed listening. Thank you so much, Lois, for joining us and for your insight. And Ramses, you are up next to share your closing remarks. Yes, thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Uh, as a closing remark, I would mention uh, as a Finnish uh, my my point on the Finnish model, uh, and you know, guys, I came from Africa, so I'm pretty close to Abdul. And speaking of Egyptian model, for example, which is the worst, like everybody hates it. Uh, when I used when I when I took my logic courses, I, I took two courses of logic, uh, just like Dan, but in a computer science school. And guess what? Our our professor was very open, and we had like three uh, textbooks. Choose whatever textbook you want, and blah blah blah. And when I'm done with the course, I really liked it because I wanted to to learn it. But there were other people in the same classroom who didn't want it, you know, who were forced to learn logic. And what was the result? The, the result was bad scores. Some people failed. And also, uh, some people hated it. Like uh, they were like, uh, I, "I am in computer science just because I want to design websites or whatever." And it's their right. Like it's you. It, it, you should have the ability to learn what you need, what you want, and skip what you don't want. Yeah, I'm ignorant. So what? I'm happy with that. Like everybody of us is ignorant when it comes to whatever field of knowledge. Like we don't know everything. I, so my final point here is the want, you know, the authority, the ability to choose. And this applies to all people. Even when you are a baby, you should be able to choose what you want. And, and instead of making you want to learn, we should actually making you able to express what you want and what you don't. And that's it for me. Great. Thank you so much, Ramses. I, I really enjoy the humility to hear among this group. And I want to add on to that. And that I totally don't claim to be right about uh, everything. And there's so much more out there to learn. As Lois said, 
of course, looking into the Finland system and other things too would be um, interesting. Now, what I would like to say as my closing remark is that, well, one thing about the, the elite, the elite people, this is so much bigger than school, than even the topics I bring up about diet. It's so much bigger than that. This is about lifestyle. This is about a game that we're all playing, whether we realize it or not. And um, this is about actually waking up to the truth and getting in tune with reality, which is in nature and has nothing to do with the world, which is just an idea. I mean, think about it. So I'll use um, the United States right now. This isn't really the United States. It's just a piece of land that we all collectively agree that we're gonna call this America. But in reality, none of that exists. It's just a man-made belief. And that's what it is. We live in a world where we get trapped in these belief sets um, that control people and take them away from reality. And that's what's really happening. Uh, my belief uh, is that the real people in control, so to say, uh, of the masses, they're uh, probably can count the number on our hand, probably less than five people. And they probably live on some island that doesn't even exist on the map. Uh, they would never actually reveal themselves because they know that there's always going to be people who are awake. So the political or financial elites that Cesare may be referring to, like you know, Rockefeller families, other politicians and Gates, uh, they're not really elite or in control, so to say. They're just as much puppets as everyone else. Now, the way I look at uh, the Civil War in education, and it's not just the Civil War, it's a lot of worse. James Bryan Conant wrote that the public was so engaged in the Great Depression and first World War I, then World War II, that few fully realized that a full transformation of the schools had occurred between 1900 and 1930 a lot of these are just distractions because the biggest thing uh, to keep in mind is that life before the civil war and life after the war were two completely different things. Before the war, people had personal independence and personal um, freedom, pretty much. They lived on their own plots of land. They were completely self-sufficient. They didn't rely on the government. They had big families and community. After the civil war, you started to see a rise in industry, decentralization of the family, bigger centralization of the uh, you know, central government. Nowadays, people are so reliant on the government that if they lose their job, that's it. They have to buy all their food from the grocery store. They're dependent on the government maybe to send them money. They are completely dependent on everybody else but themselves. So the way I look at it is that the Civil War actually marked the transference from uh, a republic into a democracy. And in a democracy that 51% can tyrannize over the 49. Well, that concludes our meeting. Very, very interesting discussion today. Lots of great insightful points. And we will continue this next week if Cesari is still up to presenting his idea. So once again, actually, let's just take another show of hands. Who is in support of this idea? Okay, great. So we have Stacy, myself, Ramses, Lois, and Dan is kind of half and half. And then Abdul and Cesari are either abstaining or don't agree. Okay, well, thanks to everybody for participating today. This idea is in Egora, and for our viewers and listeners, if you enjoy this idea, you can go ahead and support it there as well at egora-ilp.org. You'll also find information about our upcoming meetings. We have a handful of them every week, and of course, Thunderdome happens every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central. And last but not least, please like our page and join our group on Facebook, which you can find at facebook.com slash groups slash citizens assembly. Thank you again to everybody and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.